this is actually, <coughs> it might be patented, I don't know, by the Gartner Company. It's called the Gartner Hype Cycle. Hype means something, you do something new, um, you discover that a pen can write an ink, and you go, wow, and you sell it to everyone in the world, and that's hype, because the pens run out of ink, so you're not so sure, it's not, it's not quite as good as you think it is, but you have a big campaign and sell it first. And so that's panacea, that means it's going to cure everything. It's going to be like aspirin, which now we know is dangerous, but before everyone was told to take aspirin for their headache or their blood or anything, it would prevent stroke, right? But now we know that maybe it's not so safe after all. But that's panacea. It's good for everything. And then the side effects and the dangers emerge because everyone takes it. And then it becomes poison. Don't take it at all, which isn't true either. And eventually it becomes ordinary and it works for everyone. So that's used in business <coughs> to judge a new invention. So I recommend that you go to the Gartner Company because it's very interesting to see how economy of the whole world, nothing to do with medicine, uses this model to understand because they want to make as much money as possible here and then they want to know what to do? Do they stop selling that and take a new one? Or it's, it's very interesting, interesting to read from them, what we can learn from the business world. So retinoblastoma has no good evidence for treatment when the rigorous scientists of medical evidence talk about retinoblastoma, they say there's no evidence on how to treat it. Of course, there's lots of anecdotal consensus and events and everything, but there's no randomized clinical trial, there's nothing at the standards that they expect in, for example, pediatric oncology, where they improve the outcomes for pediatric cancers steadily by one clinical trial after the other, building on the results <coughs> until they change survival dramatically, but we have not done that in retinoblastoma. And first in retinoblastoma, external beam was first discovered to be useful, it could kill retinoblastoma tumor cells in the eye. By the 1960s, uh, the group in New York, uh, Ellsworth and Reese, and then about the 70s, Abramson joined, joined the group in New York. And every child was treated with retinoblastoma when the eye was salvageable. And the papers say it will cure retinoblastoma in every eye. The child, no eye will need to be taken out, those words are in the papers about radiation. And then we discovered, um, and then through the, starting in the 70s, the second cancers that these children got in the radiation field started to emerge. But it was not really recognized for 10 more years because there was no trial. There was no recording of the outcomes for every single child. Each child was treated as a special case, and so then they forgot to notice that the ones that got second cancers and died had had certain kinds of radiation. Particularly, they actually had the very worst, and this is not published anywhere, but it's, it's the truth. It's too scary to be published. The children that got interarterial, um, what was the drug they used, Tara? Uh, chemotherapy, intraarterial, intracarotid arterial. They couldn't do it through the femoral artery. They put it straight in the carotid artery. And those children, and then they did that while they were getting radiation. Almost 100% got tumors and died of their second cancer in that field of combined chemotherapy and radiation. So by 19, 
1986, it was recognized children shouldn't have radiation. Children all around the world where there's not other treatments been available have still had radiation as primary treatment, but I think now this curve is too high. It's, it's really down here. Because we have new things like intravitreal chemotherapy to need, we hardly ever need to radiate an eye anymore, and that's really good news. <coughs> so we now have another treatment that's followed exactly the same path. The first publication, I don't know what year it was, but it's about here, about 2008, also from New York, uh, was on intraarterial chemotherapy. The first publication was the New York Times. A famous baseball player, his child was treated with intraarterial chemotherapy, and it was very public on the New York Times, not in the medical literature. And uh, so the patients, the public, everyone said, this is fantastic. And exactly the same words are in the papers. No child ever needs to lose an eye because of intraarterial chemotherapy. But now we find that it's not quite so good. There are children who are dying because they had intraarterial when they had unilateral root DIs that could have been removed. Um, the treatment goes on with too many cycles of intraarterial after there's blood in the eye and there's new bleeding and they keep, keep going. Um, so this is a, a big problem and it's emerging in papers that come out one at a time. Still no clinical trial, still no organized evidence. And even the children who keep their eye, um, nobody knows what the vision is. The papers report the electroretinogram, not the vision. I think you can measure the actual vision in any child, no matter what age they are. So it's not a good excuse to say they're too young. You can always measure vision. Um, and I think that the cora gets a big dose, so it suffers. And I think for your lifetime of your retina to work well, you actually need a good cora. So I think that uh, intraarterial chemo um, does a good job in certain situations. And I think we will come to defined indications, defined categories, but we need studies. And I wish Francis were here. Francis Mounier plane is going to land in one hour, I think. And he will uh, address particularly intraarterial chemotherapy, but he has got very interesting data uh, very well done on, on intra-arterial for specific purposes, for specific situations with every child study. So we can look forward to finding a role for intra-arterial chemotherapy. I, um, 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 we published a paper, a systematic review, which I was very honored that two papers from the Chinese presented yesterday commented on that paper where we studied all the literature. The review was not of intraarterial chemotherapy. We studied the publications on intraarterial chemotherapy. And it was um, sad to say that many of these big papers in the most important journals had not had the statistics done properly. So you actually, and many children are probably in 10 different papers, but you don't know which child's in multiple papers. So you can't actually count anything very well. So this is a big problem, and it's a problem of the way papers are written about the literature, and it reflects height. It reflects that attitude of, this is so wonderful, we don't need to worry about doing the statistics carefully. And if that's not a good idea, we should all learn from these two mistakes, I think, in radiation first, which is very dramatic, and, and now the same phenomenon in intraarterial chemotherapy and move forward because there are very exciting new discoveries, new treatments. We will have new molecular drugs coming forth, but we must do it carefully and well so we don't go way up and down. Instead, we go up and up and up and up like the pediatric cancers did. So um, that's all I'd like to say on this, except to challenge you. And at the end of this workshop, can we work on ways to move forward to carefully evaluate clinical outcomes with treat with whatever treatment comes up. Any questions? You're free to tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> 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 <laughs>